Hi, everybody. The learning objectives for this module is really not to go through necessarily all the details of all the different tests. It's just kind of identify the typical tests that we use on an embankment dam design and kind of how they're used and what things you should think about when you're scheduling those tests. That's kind of what I wanted to focus on more, more than the, the individual tests themselves. Um, start off with gradation testing. Cassie already went through this quite a bit, but everybody's probably pretty familiar with their sieves. Put the material in there, shake them, weigh them, and then you can come up with your gradation curve based on the percent of material that's retained by weight. Um, hydrometer tests, they're performed on fine grain soils. Same thing, trying to get your um, percent uh, material for each different size below a number 200 sieve. So these are really important, obviously, if you have a lot of fine grain materials at your site um, to identify how much clay and how much silt is part of that fine grain material. Here's a typical gradation curve. Um, I made it up, and but just to kind of show you, you know, what, what you're typically looking at here, you've got your um, you know, percent finer by weight on the y-axis there, done by a percentage, and then you've got your particle size on the bottom in millimeters and your sieves up on the top. Um, so we're gonna do a quick question here just to make sure everybody understands a gradation curve. Uh, it's gonna be in Socrative, um, and we're just gonna ask for what your D60 is. The reason I'm asking this question is because I was sitting in a meeting a couple of years ago and there was an engineer who will not be named who said, I need a D90 of 30%. And that made zero sense because the, the D is for the diameter. So when you say I need a D60, it's the diameter at which all the material is 60% of the material is finer than that number. So when he said that, I said, mm, people don't quite understand what maybe these are. So I figured I'd go ahead and ask. So I think you can go into Socrative. Hopefully everybody got about 20 millimeters. You didn't need to be too specific on that, but just to show how that's kind of used there. Um, here's another three gradation curves I made up. Um, and the key takeaway on this one is when you see big steep changes in the curve, that means there's a lot of material between these two sieves. So like in this uniform material, most of the material for this gradation I'm not getting my little cursor here. Uh, here. I'll just use the laser pointer so I don't mess anything up. Um, so if you see a big steep drop, again, that means that there's a lot of material between those two sieves, in this case, the number 10 and the number 40 sieve. When you see flat areas like this on the gap graded curve, that means there's not a lot of material here. So for this particular one, and gap graded materials are something you really want to keep out for because they're usually internally unstable. The reason for that is you've got a lot of kind of larger material over here and then a lot of finer grain material over here, this material can move into and through that material. So those are things to look out for, particularly when you're doing your filter design, which we'll get to more detail later. Uh, yes, sir. This is a little argument I got with a couple other folks about gap graded. Mm -hmm. um, particularly the gap, um, is there a specific definition for at what point it stops being gap graded? Does that have to be perfectly flat, near flat? How is that? Um, that's a that's a good question. Because I got into a weird argument about it with with a couple other folks, and it was we were trying to like pin down the definition definition of, of when it oh, becomes gap graded. Gap -rated. Oh, I don't it's think not it's gap graded. Gap -rated. Yeah, exactly. It's, that's a good question. Honestly, I don't know where right offhand. I just typically again like to look for these sort of flat areas in there, but I don't know if it's. It, I mean, I'd say if it travels across several sieve sizes, it's probably gap graded. If it's if it's you know just kind of like a smaller flat area and here maybe across just one sieve it's probably fine, but I don't know if there's a if there's a definition for that. This is more visual too. I mean, this is like kind of uh, near flat but not perfectly flat. Right, it still qualifies yeah, as being gap. You're almost never going to see perfectly flat, right? Because that means there's literally no every every bit in that size range got through that sieve, right? So you're probably going to see just a little bit. And this one, you can see, I kind of drew it. Again, I made these up. I didn't get these from anywhere. But I drew it. You, know, you still have a little bit of material retained on that sieve. But really what you're looking for is, are there any areas where I have a, 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 I'm losing a lot of material in this particular size range? You know what I mean? Okay. So it's still very much visual. I think, visual I think so. And I mean, Greg, do you know if there's an actual definition for when it's called gap graded? I don't, I'm not aware of one. Okay. So maybe that will yeah. capture it then. Yeah, but I don't know what the specific where exactly it's defined as gap graded or not. Okay, so yeah, just checking. Yep. So a good transition here. So uh, a few things that we look at, and this is mostly for coarse grain material where we're looking at 
coefficient of uniformity, how uniform is that material, and the coefficient of curvature, which gives you that curvature of your the shape of your um, gradation curve there. And that will come back later when we talk more about USCS classifications. Um, this is the internal instability, ah, instability criteria developed by Sherard. Um, you can see this line right here, this 4x line, and this can be moved anywhere along the gradation curve. Essentially, if it's steeper than this line, you know, you got a material that kind of comes in, comes down there a little bit steeper, it's probably fine. If it's flatter than that, so if it's really, really well graded material, um, you could see some potential inter internal instability. And then we've got we've got sort of the limits here that we're we're kind of looking for with our coefficient of uniformity and our coefficient of curvature. And again, that 4x line. And again, this comes into play a lot with uh, filter design. You don't want to make them, you want them fairly uniform materials. You don't want them so well graded that you can actually get internal instability of the filter itself. Um, some cautions for gradations, uh, maximum particle size limited by sampling method. Cassie brought this up a lot. Again, you don't want to use, say, a two inch diameter split spoon if you're dealing with some large gravel materials that will get pushed out of the way. You won't get representative samples in there. Um, larger samples also, when you're doing the gradation, if you look at the ASTM standards, if you've got large particle size in your uh, samples, you really need, by weight, you need a lot of material. I mean, there's some material that's so big, you literally need almost a truckload of material to officially run the gradation sample on it. As you get lower and smaller, you need less material for that. Um, here's a, just a picture from the Holtz and Kovacs book. Um, again, Cassie probably already went through a lot of this. But you know, sub-rounded versus rounded, sub-angular versus angular, it's good to know, particularly for hydraulic conductivity, based on how those grain sizes and material in there, it, it affects how the water flows through the material. So it's something to think about when you're doing in your investigation and something to think about um, when you're developing your lab testing program, things you want to look at. Um, Atterberg limits, again, Cassie touched on this. This is a good little picture of what she was talking about, where the material goes from solid to semi-solid to plastic and to liquid. And this is mostly where we're looking at is between what our liquid limit and our plastic limit is and what the PI is between those two. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on here, Cassie pretty much went through this, but um, working in a lab and working near labs, these tests are not, they're not cookbook tests, right? They require a little bit of finesse. Typically, I know the one of the labs that I worked in, we had one person who ran the Atterbergs. And the reason we did that is so we could keep consistency across there. They're not the easiest tests to do. They're not just like a follow these steps and you'll get you'll get the correct answer. So that's one thing to think about. Um, like I said, there's there's a little bit more um, art to them than than just like a cookie cutter test. Uh, soil classification, again, Cassie went through this. Um, it was developed by Casa Grande during World War II. At one point, we, there were several different methods of soil classification and the Bureau and the Corps decided to get them into one so that we could all be calling everything the same thing across different projects, different project sites. Um, there's an ASTM for there's a laboratory classification system, uh, 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 laboratory classification, which you can get if you assign that. Um, typically, when you're assigning materials, you got to, even if you don't think it's plastic, still assign an Atterberg, a cider gradation, and then assign this laboratory classification so you'll get that out of the lab and you don't have to develop that yourself. Um, and there's also a visual classification for when you're out in the field. A lot of these make sense. These are hopefully most everybody knows the USCS classifications letters, um, G for gravel, C for clay, L for low plasticity. The weird one, M for silt. Uh, so this actually comes from the Swedish. I'm not going to try to pronounce these, but this one means fine sand. And this one is evidently the term for silt. So that's where the M comes from, if you're ever curious. Um, here's straight out of the ASTM guidelines. So you see this is for fine grain soils based on your liquid limit um, and whether it plots above or below the A line and how much is retained on the number 200 sieve. Um, you can go through and get your your classification description based on that. Same thing for coarse grain soils here. Again, depending on how much percent gravel you have and how much percent sand you have and your coefficient of uniformity and your coefficient of curvature, you get whether it's well graded, poorly graded, and what your description is through there. Um, for verbal descriptions, uh, if it's greater than 30%, you'll add a Y to it. So 
sandy silt, for instance, um, with gravel or some uh, cobbles, trace, boulders, kind of go through based on your percentages and how those are, are defined. Uh, here's, some, here's some rules. The Y, don't use Y by itself is the silty soil. You know, it's always going to be a silty sand or a clay gravel. Um, don't use multiple Ys. I love to do it as a joke. This is a silty, sandy, gravel, clay, gravelly, cobbly, bouldery, um, but don't actually use it in practice. Um, and again, Cassie touched on this quite a bit, but there are lots of different attributes you need to assign to each of these soils. Um, I like to put this up just to show how many there are. There's a lot of times you get back, you know, you get back a, a log and they're, and they're just, there's like two things listed, gray, clay, you know, and they're missing a lot of different descriptions in there. Uh, the reason that color is um, circled here is that it's in the moist condition. So always have a spray bottle with you when you're out in the field so you can spray down the material to get the color correct. Um, here's just some example descriptions. Uh, you guys can uh, read these on your own. I actually pulled some of these from the ASTS, uh, ASTM classifications. So we'll start getting into some of the more, um, the harder tests, I guess you'd call it. So um, lab hydraulic conductivity tests, you just have a picture here of your typical constant head test and your typical falling head tests. The problem with these um, is you only get vertical, right? So it's hard to get, and a lot of times, particularly with dams, we've got layered materials and we're more, we're more concerned about the, the horizontal permeability. Um, the big one that most people are using now is the flexible wall permeameter test. I'd say this is kind of the uh, typical in the industry um, to get your hydraulic conductivity. Um, it's used quite a bit, has a lot more flexibility than the, what I'd say, the older tests. Um, here is just a, um, a plan showing how you would do a piezometer rising or falling head tests. Um, I believe this came out of the, yeah, the engineering geology fan field manual from the Bureau. Um, it just shows all the different steps required to get hydraulic conductivity in a piezometer. Nice thing when you're doing these field tests is you can actually get that, that horizontal permeability as opposed to the vertical permeability that you get from the lab tests. There's also slug testing. So these are actually some pictures from what we did out at Blakely Dam in Arkansas, um, where we'd actually had, um, we'd actually push the water down with pressure, and then you monitor the water as it comes back up in the hole. Alternatively, you can actually put a slug down the test, you raise the water level, and then you, you time how far it gets back down into the formation. Um, packer tests. So, um, Particularly in rock, these are extremely useful. You'll put a packer in the test. On here on the left, you see a single packer test. So you got sort of the bottom of the hole is your other side, and then you put a packer in the top part of the, top part of the testing zone, and you can test the, the permeability of this material in between. Alternatively, you can drill the entire hole out and do a double packer where, you're, where you identify a zone and you actually put two packers in. Um, speaking to some of my geologist friends, particularly Todd Lohr, uh, the single packer test is typically preferred because you can actually get flow around those packers, and if you have two packers in there, it can just lead to more, um, more issues with your testing. But this, again, really good way to get your, your basically your, your overall permeability of material because you've got water flowing into the sidewalls, potentially down out of here, but you're really looking at that more of that horizontal permeability, which in a lot of cases, particularly with uh, stratified deposits, is, is going to be key. Um, I just wanted to kind of show some of the flow regimes when you're doing uh, some of these packer tests. Um, when you pressure, so they're each, they're all pressured up your first run, a little more pressure for your second run, max pressure at your, your C, and then you drop back down using the same pressure intervals on the way back down. And depending on your Lujan values, um, and Lujan value is defined, I've got it up here for people who don't know. Um, it's a loss of water in liters per minute per meter of borehole over a pressure of one millibar. So it's a way to kind of to measure your flow consistently across all these different um, tests that you're doing. So depending on how that, how that flow works at each of those different pressures, you can see 
what kind of flow you're getting into and out of those fractures of the rock, which is really important when you're out in the field. This one, hydraulic fracture, is a big one, particularly if you're doing an investigation for a dam. You do not want to hydraulically fracture your foundation. So we've actually got a whole ER-1807 where um, people have to submit drilling plans to the core if you're drilling in or near a core dam so we can make sure you're not going to do this. So if you see this, typically very bad when you're talking about dam foundations. Um, consolidation tests, and we're going to get into this quite a bit more detail for our um, exercise coming up this afternoon, but just wanted to show a typical uh, odometer testing uh, machine and kind of a typical test where you've got your C sub C value here, your C sub R, your recompression curve here. So it's kind of your version compression curve and your recompression curve. And again, we'll get into a lot more detail on that in the next module. Dispersion tests. So uh, three typical types of tests for dispersion. Again, Cassie touched on this. If you have a dispersive material at your site, either in your borrow or in your foundation, it's a big problem that changes how your filter design is done. It's a key issue. There's one site I remember I went to in Oklahoma and you walked up and the lake was red because the embankment material is red. Essentially, as soon as this material hit water, it dispersed out in there. And so it's very obvious, it's a very dispersive site. So this down here in the bottom left-hand corner is your crumb test, essentially very simple test. Drop a piece of soil into distilled water into a you know, clear container and you see how that material disperses over time. Uh, and it goes all the way from not dispersive at all to extremely dispersive over here. I like to use these crumb tests. They're cheap, they're easy. Use as many of them as possible so you can identify zones that you think might be dispersive. You identify areas that might not, but you really need to run the double hydrometer tests, these sort of more sophisticated tests to really figure out if that material is dispersive or not. I've seen crumb tests that look like this, and then you run it through a pinhole test and it actually turns out to be dispersive. So crumb test isn't like an end-all be-all, um, but I'd say I typically go through the most crumb tests and then when I've identified areas that I want to check whether they're non-dispersive or they're dispersive, I'll run some more uh, double hydrometers and pinhole tests. Now, so like I mentioned, crumb tests, pretty cheap and effective, can ident help identify uh, potential problem areas, but it's not an end-all be-all to tell you whether you have dispersive material or not. A uh, little more details on the double hydrometer test. It's uh, you, run, you run a regular hydrometer test with standard dispersants, you run it with no dispersants, and then you compare those two to say whether it's dispersive or not. The pinhole test, which I think is, for me, the Cadillac of dispersion testing, gives you a whole range from, from highly dispersive all the way down to completely erosion resistant. And this, to me, really tells you whether you've got um, dispersive material in there. As I noted before, use all three. None of these are independently conclusive. Use them all to figure out. And if you do, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, it does affect how your filter design is calculated. Um, soil compaction tests, proctor testing. I'm going to go ahead and assume most of you are pretty familiar with these. Um, but you got your standard proctor and your modified proctor. And based on the amount of compactive energy that you're planning on using at the site, you'll pick either the standard proctor or the modified proctor. Um, I'd say for most dam construction, standard proctor is going to be fine. If you've ever been near or around or worked in a lab, you know what these are. You've got your smaller mold, your larger mold, your standard proctor hammer, your modified proctor hander, hammer, and you feel, hear people pounding proctors all day long. It can drive you insane. Uh, but these are made to make sure that the drop height is the same for each one, and you're getting the uh, similar amount of uh, compactive effort applied to each sample. So when you come to a site, you're not just going to do one curve and say, that's, that's my curve for my material. You're going to do a family of curves, like shown over here on the right hand. And the reason for that is even within the same borrow material, even with the same, seems like all the same material, you're going to actually get a few different curves. And when you're, actually, when you're out there testing the in, doing in-situ tests, you, you need those to figure out which curve you're, you're actually on. And so when you get one of these single point tests out here, Depending on how, and you have to look up this ASHTO manual, but depending on how, where it falls, you might be able to get out your French curve and, and basically draw the shape of the corresponding family of curves to figure out where you are, or you might have to run a brand new, a whole new proctor curve for that material. 
Um, so for compacted clay, we're at dam construction of your core, you're always going to want to be wet of optimum. And the reason for that is you get lower hydraulic conductivity. That's what we want out of our clay core material. Also, when you're compacting this material up against an abutment or a concrete structure, when it's wet of optimum, it kind of fills in those gaps a little bit better. Um, so you're going to want to stay wet of optimum with almost all your clay material for your dams. Uh, now we're going to get into soil strength testing. But before I get into that, because that's quite a long section, does anybody have any questions on the test that I just went through? Quick little, nope. Okay. So uh, shear strength. So this is the big one, obviously, for stability. Um, we've got I'm just showing a circular failure mode right here. You've got your compression tests right here that, that basically captures this portion of the curb. Your simple shear test down here on the bottom, we're going to get into that in quite a bit more detail. And then technically an extension test here for this part of the curve, but I'd say in general, that's typically not used. Um, what we don't show here that actually comes up on a lot of dams is a non-circular failure, where you actually come down here, find a weak material in your layer, and then it follows that weak material before it, it eventually exits the surface. And that's where that simple shear test comes in really handy, because a lot of times that can control your stability of your dam, depending on your foundation conditions. Uh, we'll start with a simple test. This is the uh, direct shear. Um, when I was working in highway embankment construction, I used these quite a bit. Um, in dam construction, I'd say very rarely. They're typically done for coarse grain materials. It forces a failure plane through the sample, which is not really what we want to see. We want to allow that failure plane to go where we think it, where, where it wants to go. We don't want to actually force it through here. And really, you're only getting peak strengths out of this, which we'll talk a little bit more, isn't always necessarily what we're looking at for dam construction. Um, unconfined compressive strength test, this one's pretty easy. There's no confining pressure. You're taking it out. You're, sheer, you're, you're adding a load till it, till it breaks. Uh, you're getting, a, again, getting a peak strength. You're not really seeing much post-peak. And again, there's no confining pressure. So it's not, it's, it's good and it's cheap and you can run a lot of them, but uh, not typically used for more of the um, higher level stability exercises. The triaxial compression test. This is what we're going to be using most for our stability material, particularly for fine grain soils. Um, you can you can add a confining pressure to it, so you can run it at different confining pressures. You can measure your pore pressures within the sample, which is huge. So you can get your total stress envelope and you can get your effective stress envelope. Um, here's just a couple quick setups of what each of these look like here. Uh, if you're uh, if you're mostly familiar with these. Um, setups if you again if you've worked in and around a the lab there's different types we're going to use so your UU test that's what you're typically going to use to get your uh, undrained shear strength of your material you got your consolidated drain test which is slow test typically not going to run these on fine grain soils because fine grain soils take a long time to drain you're typically going to be using your consolidated undrained test with your pore pressure measurements that's where you're going to be able to get your total stress envelope and your effective stress envelope, which is really important for stability analyses. Here's just some typical results for the UU test. Since the material is unconsolidated, with your confining pressure, you should essentially have the same failure envelope, depending on how far it goes out. Um, again, this is really good to get your undrained shear strength, which you're going to use for your post-construction um, stability evaluation. Amanda's going to get into that in a lot of detail tomorrow, but just to kind of back out which test you're going to want to look at for that. And here's here's the one, like I said, that you're mostly going to be involved with, which is your consolidated undrained test with your pore pressure measurements. So here we've got our total stress envelope right here. And then when we subtract the pore pressure out, we get our effective stress envelope. So the effective stress envelope is always going to be steeper and your and your um, Cohesion is always going to be lower because these circles, when you subtract the pore pressure out of there, they're always going to move to the left. So you can see your total stress envelope here from the last and then your effective stress envelope there. Again, steeper, less cohesion. Does anybody have, has anybody had experience with the direct simple shear test? Show of hands there. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, so the direct simple shear test, again, it, particularly if you have a, a long, you know, a weak material in your foundation and then there's a chance that you could have a long kind of nearly horizontal um, 
failure path, that's where you really want to understand what's going on and you want this direct simple shear test. It'll really tell you what's going on shearing in this sort of horizontal direction of your soil. Um, uh, some advantages of the direct simple shear test, similar to the CU test, the pore pressures can be measured. Uh, cyclic tests can be performed so you can see how it how it's going to behave under a um, earthquake loading. You can also do the same thing with your CU tests, which again is really good for earthquake loading. Um, and the plane of the failure is not fixed like a direct shear test, and that's the key. You're not forcing it to go through um, a particular layer of the soil. The big takeaway with both of these, whether it's the direct shear test or the CU test is to make sure that the confining pressures that you assign for your test are indicative of what the stress conditions, if it's in the foundation in particular, what the stress conditions are going to be after the dam is there, if that makes sense. So you don't want to, when you're, when you're confining your, when you look at your confining pressure, the in situ pressure uh, stress for that sample might be, I'm just going to make up a number here, but say 1,000 PSF. But when you put the dam there, you're gonna be somewhere closer to 3000 PSF. You wanna make sure that you assign those samples so that the stress ranges are covered once the dam is in place. So you need to look at future stress conditions for, for when you are assigning these samples. Um, there's also the ring shear test. So this is where we're looking at residual strength of material, um, which again, can be really important if you have particularly, so in the front range of Colorado, there's some claystone materials that have seen some shearing in the past. And when you add that low to the dam onto there, you're actually pushing those materials all the way to the residual stress, which can be very, very low. I mean, talking like friction angles of six degrees. And if you have that in your foundation, you have to know about it. So these, uh, these um, ring shear tests are a really good way to figure out what the residual strength of that material is, particularly if you might have that in your foundation. And you can just see here, when you run the direct shear test, it stops up. You don't see a whole lot of post-peak um, shear displacement in there. But when you run that when you run that ring shear test, and what it keeps doing is it keeps spinning around and spinning around until you've really kind of aligned all those particles and you've gotten everything really nice and um, smooth, and you'll get down to a really a much lower um, strength for that material. And here's it shown in just a stress for strain plot. Um, you get a lot of people, and again, you know, you've got your peak up here. Um, but what you got to understand is how that material behaves post peak, right? You've got your critical state here, and then your residual strength strength all the way down here. The problem is, is if you're just using peak strengths and you're loading things all the way up to your peak strength, there's a chance you're going to see some plastic deformation, which typically with these structures is not what we're looking for. Um, I don't have time to get into critical state soil mechanics, but there's a chance that you're gonna be looking at something post-peak that you're actually gonna be designing to, to make sure you don't, again, get to see those plastic deformations. Fully softened shear strength. So someone here was from the Fort Worth district, I think, you, yes. So we have a lot of shallow slides on our dams in, in that Dallas area. And the reason for that is because they're high plasticity clays and they're on not necessarily super steep slopes, but when they get, when they dry out and they desiccate and then we get more water on them, we get these sh relatively shallow slides. So what you'll see here on this figure here is these are kind of the number of slides that we're seeing versus the depth of the slide. So you'll see here the compacted clay embankments, we actually get a lot of fairly shallow slides. These are less than five feet here, five to 10 feet here, and then only a few that are more than 10 feet. The reason for this, again, is when you have these high plasticity clays and you get this wetting and drying, you actually get a fully softened strength condition. And when that happens, you can get these, these shallow slides and use haste dams. So there's an ASTM test, 7608, which is another torsional ring shear test that gets you that fully softened shear strength test. So if you identify high plasticity clays in your borrow and you're building an embankment out of that, then you can get to, you want you might want to flatten those slopes out a little bit more to account for this fully softened strength condition. I probably could have gone on a lot more with rock strength, but what I, and Cassie's probably gonna kill me because I'm just doing this in one slide. But 
Um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, your rock tests are very similar to your soil tests. You're still, you're running on confined compression, you're running triaxial compression. Uh, you might even be running direct shear on some of the, um, some of the joint joints in there. Um, the reason I wanted to point this out though, is a lot of times you're going to end up with a material like a clay stone or even a highly weathered sandstone. It's actually going to behave a lot more like a soil. So you want to make sure that you test those rocks and see are there are they property more rock like or are they more soil like and are they going to control control your foundation design? This um, this is a chart that actually Greg put together, um, which I think is really good. It shows a lot of the tests that we just went through over here on the y axis and kind of where you know at what point of your design are you going to use those tests? You can see like for instance sieve analysis. You're going to use that for everything. Um, hydrometer, a lot of times it's for filter compatibility. Sometimes it might be for seepage as well. So it's not like an end-all, be-all. If it, you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to use that test for these ones, but it's just typically where those tests kind of show up as you're going through your embankment design. Um, one thing I did want to point out here, <laughs> erodibility is not only is erodibility within the embankment, but also for like spillway erodibility, we'd probably be looking at like a UCS test and, and looking at the joints of the rock in the spillway. Um, but this is really useful. I'll go through this so you can kind of, it gives you kind of a roadmap for what tests you're gonna be looking at for each different type of uh, analysis. Uh, the learning recap, again, we kind of went through this earlier in the, you know, we wanna be able to identify the tests that we use uh, for embankment design, USCS, we went through quite a bit. Um, dispersive soils, again, big, big issue. Uh, you got to figure that out before, you know, early on in your design. Um, and then that mention about the confining pressures, that's a big one. Make sure your confining pressures give you post-construction stress condition along with in-situ stress condition. And I think that's it, unless there's any questions.